you're glad to be in church, somebody say amen. amen. Man, it's good to see a lot of you back. I'm glad you're here. Man, glad to have you back in service with us. And man, was that good singing? Somebody say amen. I mean, that was so good. I, I told Dusty, I said, man, if you can't get excited about Jesus coming back to take you to heaven one day, you might not be saved. I'm just saying, you may not know Jesus if that don't speak to you. And man, I sure appreciate the singing, man. Good job. It's good to see you. And I'm so glad to have you guys back with us. And a lot of you guys have been battling and fighting. And some of you have been kind of running and dodging. But it's good to see you. And I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us today. And all those that are joining us online, listen, we don't want you to sit and be a just somebody watching. We want you to be interacting. And so if you would, if you will amen the preaching, it'll give me something to compare to. I'll be able to say, you know, the people in the place, man, they were dead as a hammer. But online, those folks were excited. So you give us some likes and you comment and uh, please share our video. But it's so good to see you guys. If you're a first-time guest, it's the first time you've ever been at Liberty, I want to say thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us. It is a pleasure to have you here. Now, you can do us a great favor. You can take this card that's in the chair in front of you and fill out whatever information you would feel comfortable filling out. If you've never filled one of those out, we'd love for you to do that and drop it in the offering bucket on the way out. Now, I promise you guys, if you put your email and your phone number and your address on there, we're not going to spam you. I'm not going to show up at your house tomorrow to check and make sure you dusted. We're not going to email you a thousand things and text you a thousand things. What we want to do is just know who you are. It makes it so much easier for us to go on Facebook and cheat and find your face with your name and be able to say, oh, that's who they were. So if you would do that, it would help us a great deal. You can drop it at the connection desk, throw it in the bucket on the way out. But thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us. We don't take it lightly. We know in the South that in order to go to a church, you passed 10 churches. And so we're thankful that you came here to worship with us today. And we're glad you're here. How many people were here either online or in person last Sunday? How many people were here? All right, so I don't have to catch a lot of you up. You know, we started a brand new sermon series last week called Reset. And we made the statement that God's people need to reset their lives. I compared us to a cell phone. When you have a problem with your cell phone and you call IT support, what are they going to tell you to do first before you do anything else? Have you turned it off and turned it back on? I mean, I could work for the IT companies. It's real simple. Turn it off, turn it back on. Oh, it's fixed. We knew it would be. Go on, right? And we made the statement last week that most of us have so many things going on in our lives and in our minds that we're not able to prioritize and focus on what God wants us to do. And we made this statement last week. We said, hey, we need to reset our minds. And I said, how do we reset our minds? By getting in the Word of God. The Word of God will reflect how we think if we get in the Word of God. And many of you here accepted the challenge to read your Bible through in one year. I have a ton of people text me, call me, tell me on the way out, comment on Facebook, hey, I accepted that challenge, preacher. But I want to encourage you. Some of you are like me. You accepted the challenge on Sunday, and on Wednesday you failed. Well, I, I want to encourage you. Just start back to it. Just read today's Bible reading today. Don't quit because you stumbled. Keep on going. Read your Bible. Just do it. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't let it defeat you that you missed a day or two. Just get right back in there and do it. I made the statement yesterday in our live video, and I'm, I'm going to say it again because I want to make sure you get this. If you missed five days, don't try to read all five days. Just read the days. You know, if you don't eat your vegetables on Friday and you don't eat your vegetables on Saturday, you don't go on Sunday and go, well, i got to eat three days worth of vegetables, do you? Pile them all up on the table. You don't do that. You just eat what you need for the day. And so I want, you to, I want you to continue to read your Bible. Now, today I want to say that we're going to preach a message on, on resetting your focus, what you're focusing on. And then at the end of the service, I'm going to challenge you like I challenged you in the last Sunday. But this challenge is going to be different. I'm just going to say it. 98% of you in here, and that's me being generous, will not accept the challenge. You'll walk out, when you go past me, you'll say, I'm not doing that, preacher. And half the people online, you may be brave you, and, and comment, I'll do it, but I'm telling you, it's a, it, it is a difficult challenge. But I want to say this to you. If you will accept the challenge 
I really believe God will speak to you and God will help you in your life. I believe it with everything in me. Now, the reason we want to talk about focus is because focus is the most important thing in your life. You see, focus produces priorities. Priorities produce success. If you're not focused on something, you cannot prioritize what you should do. If you cannot prioritize what you should do, you will never succeed at anything in your life. And I believe with everything in me that most people focus 80% of their time and their energy on things that only produce 20% of their success. So what does that mean, preacher? It means that you take most of your time and most of your energy and you pump it into something and when you get done, you don't get hardly anything out of it in your life. Many of us want to know why our, our Christian lives are failing. We want to know why our homes are failing, why our marriages are failing, why our children are failing. And a lot of the reason is we are pumping our resources and our time into things that should not be our focus. And so today, I promise you, I don't mean to, but I'm going to challenge you from the time we get done reading our text till the end of our sermon today. We love you. If you're a first-time guest, just hang on and come back next Sunday, okay? It'll get better. I promise it will. But I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 12, and we're going to read verses 1 and verses 2. Now, Hebrews, if you know anything about Hebrews chapter 11, it is referred to as the chapter of faith. When you read Hebrews 11, what you find is the writer has given us a list of all these great people. I'm talking Samson and Moses and, and, and Abraham. And he says, he talks about Gideon and he lists all these great men and women. And he talks about all the things they were able to accomplish by faith. He says, by faith, they did all this stuff, right? And it's awesome to hear what everybody's done, right? But the real question is, how do I get that to happen in my life? You know, it's not a good enough to sit around and talk about, boy, God really used Billy Graham. I want to know how God can use Matt Burrell. And so what we find is when the shift happens in chapter 12, he goes to telling us how we can apply this to our lives. How in the world can you do great and mighty things in your life just like all these people did in chapter 11? So let's read these two verses and we'll have prayer and they'll jump right in the message. Notice what it says. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us pray. Father, I ask you, God, that you would help us, Lord, to change our focus today. Lord, I ask you, God, that you would help us to reset our focus, our priorities, and our lives. God, I ask you, Lord, that you would help us to think differently, act differently, and live differently because we see and we focus differently. Lord, I pray, God, you bless every person here, everyone watching online. God, speak to their heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when you look at these two verses, we find three things that Paul lets us know here. Paul says this in this chapter. He's like, you want to do great things for God? I got things you can do. You want to be like those people in chapter 11? Here's what you must do. And the first thing he says, I want you to notice, it's very simple, and I believe every believer would agree with this. Notice what it says in verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You know what we notice? That we notice this, and I want you to see this. Let me get my first point, guys. When you look at this first point, you see that we should focus on the main thing. What is the main thing in verse number 2? Looking unto who? Okay, all right, listen. Let's get this over. Who needs an espresso? Do I need something run out here or something? Are y'all okay? All right, good. I just want to make sure. Looking unto who? Jesus. Jesus. What is the main thing we should be focusing on? Somebody say it. Jesus. Jesus should be the one thing we're focused on. The thing that we must be focused on the most above everything else is 
Jesus. How many people will not realize that the devil will win every time your focus gets off of Jesus and gets on everybody else? What does the Ten Commandments say? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why? For I am the Lord thy God, a jealous God. How many people realize that God don't want to share his attention with nobody else? Everybody with me? God's jealous. He don't want you loving him and loving something else. He don't want you focusing on him and trying to focus on something else. He said, listen, I am the Lord your God. I want you to worship me and nothing else because I'm jealous of your affection. Now, I want you to get this, what God wants us to do. Focus on Jesus. If you don't realize anything else or get anything else I say today, understand this, that the world and the devil's desire is to get your eyes off Jesus and get your eyes on something else. You see, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that the children of Israel would follow the Ark of the Covenant. They would follow it through the wilderness. And the Bible says that they had to follow it a half mile back. Couldn't get any closer than a half mile. Why? People say, well, the Ark would kill them. No, you couldn't touch the Ark. You could be near it. You just couldn't touch it. Why did he want them to stay back? Because when you are in a church, you should know this by now, there are people who want to be first all the time. Everybody with me? They want to be important all the time. They want to have the, I'm going to get right up next to the ark so I can be closer to God than you are. But the problem with that is as people pack up against the ark, what happens to me if I'm all the way in the back? I can't even see the ark. So God says, everybody stay back so we can all see it. You're going to follow it, you've got to be able to see it. If you can't see it, you can't follow it. Everybody stay back where we can always see the ark out front of us. And friend, I want to say this to you, that our focus should be on the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus Christ. Now let me just get down here, because I need to get where you're at. Every time you get disgruntled with church, you know why you get disgruntled with church? You're not focused on Jesus. I'm going to say some things, y'all going to say this is funny. Y'all don't even believe in this. So we changed to, to offering buckets one time. You everybody seen the buckets? Little blue buckets? Somebody come, preacher, what are you doing? We cannot take the offering up in a bucket. I'm like, why not? Well, it has to be a silver or a gold plate. You said, you said Jesus took up the offering in silver and gold plates and didn't even have nowhere to live? Well, no, I'm not saying he did it. Well, then what does it matter what we take it up in? How many of you understand? We don't care what it comes in. We care how it spins. That, that's all we care. We, we don't care about what's saying. But here's what happens. When you get your eyes on the bucket, it's because your eyes aren't on Jesus. It's when you start deciding, I don't like two-ply toilet paper. We need to get one-ply toilet paper for the church. We need to paint the walls white. Why in the world are they gray? That is the devil removing your focus from Jesus and putting it on something else. Everybody with me? How many of you realize everything you do for the church, you're not really doing it for the church? I mean, give me, everybody with me? You know, if you go keep the nursery, God bless your heart. And we're so thankful for everybody who does that. Go down there, take a bunch of kids that are just, you know, missing their parents and just, just for an hour, just love on this kid. Sometimes people say, preacher, why didn't you just keep preaching? I say, because there's women in the nursery that will kill me if I keep preaching. They go down there and they do that. Who are they doing that for? Liberty Church? Are they doing it for the people who they keep the kids? No. Who are they doing it for? They should be doing it for Jesus. You see, what happens is every job we do at the church, if we're doing it for Jesus and not for the preacher and not for our friends and not for the prestige and not for the title, but if we're doing it for Jesus, it don't matter if somebody don't come by and say, hey, thank you for what you did. Because you wasn't doing it for them anyway. Everybody with me? We got a policy here. You could donate a million dollars, and if you want to, feel free. Anybody online, feel free. We can build a brand new building, and we will never mention your name because we want you to get your reward in heaven. Because we don't want you to give Liberty Church the money. We want you to give Jesus the money. We want you to give his ministry the money. We want you to give his purpose the money. We want you to give his goal the money. Don't give it to the church. Give it to God. Everybody with me? You were some of y'all ain't amen because you don't give. Yet for those of you that do, give it to Jesus. You, you understand that when our focus is on Jesus, you can't offend us. Show of hands right now. How many people in here know somebody that don't go to church anymore because somebody hurt their feelings? Yeah, most people who don't go to church anymore, it's because somebody hurt their feelings. You know what happened? They got their eyes off Jesus and they looked at a person. 
I'm going to tell you right now, our church is full of imperfect people that got major problems. It does. Oh, you can clap for that. Some of you ain't clapping because you're scared we'll think you got problems. We know you got problems. Here's what I want you to get. I want you to understand this today. Listen, when people come in, they bring problems with them. And the reason churches got problems is because they got people. And I'm telling you right now, if you focus on people and problems, you'll never serve God. Focus on Jesus Christ. Put your eyes on him. And if you're looking for a, a, a perfect people and a perfect church and perfect group, it's not going you're never going to find that. But Jesus is always perfect. Always. Never failed us one time. Focus on the right thing. So here's the first thing you got to do. Focus on the, your, your, your mind on the right thing because here's what's happening. The devil in the world is doing everything it good to get your focus off Jesus and get it on something else. Now I want you to see the second thing. And you're probably not going to like this one as much, but it's okay. Notice what it says. Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. He says this. He says, focus on Jesus and eliminate distractions. Distractions. Anybody here have a life of distractions? I saw a meme. Cracked me up. Yo, yo, I want y'all to see this. Look, look, this. look at this meme. This meme's hilarious. I'm inviting friends over to stare at their phones, and you're invited. Have you ever done that at your house, like have your family, and some of us got grown kids and, and all that, and you have them all over the house, and it's all nice and quiet in there, and all of a sudden you look around, and guess what? Everybody in there is on their phones. You're like, heck, we could have just texted each other tonight. We didn't have to show up to do this. You ever do that? You see, distractions is the devil's tool. Distractions is the world's tool. And so here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, lay aside every weight and the sin. Now, this is where you're not going to like. You see, everybody here knows sin needs to be done away with, right? But how many people realize that the strip club's not what's keeping most men in church from serving God? Some of y'all never heard that word in church, have you? <laughs> if, if you hadn't, I'm sorry. They're real places. They really exist. People really struggle with it. <laughs> but how many people realize that's not what's holding back the average Christian man from serving God? It's not. The average Christian man is not struggling to serve God because he has a methamphetamine addiction. Some do, and if you do, bless your heart, we're praying for you, we'll help you. God can deliver you. But that's not the biggest problem the church has got. Everybody understand? People are not walking around struggling with some of these major sins that stop them from serving God. But let me tell you what, there's a different kind of distraction, and it's called a weight. You notice he, he says there are sins we got to get rid of and there's weights we got to get rid of. And the weights are more dangerous than the sin because the weights are not sin. Now that's going to get quiet, Dusty. I'm going to need you to amen like shout and run here in a minute. <laughs> See, what happens is the men are not struggling with the things I mentioned with. They're struggling with the hobbies and the relationships and their jobs. That's what's keeping them from focusing on Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what men do. Men be a, who, whoever man this is I'm talking to who's on the golf course right now playing golf, you know what he's saying to himself? I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. He's right, but you can't be much of one without it. That's funny, y'all. He's saying the guys I'm with, they're pretty good guys. And he's probably right, they are. He says golf's not sin, and he's right, it's not. But when things come between you and your service to God, it doesn't matter what it is. If it is not helping you get closer to God and it's pushing you away from God, you've got to get rid of it in your life. And the reason that's hard for us to amen is because we train our kids and our families the same way. I'm going to get personal. Y'all okay? Is everybody okay? Yeah. On Facebook, are you okay? I can't hear you, so I'll just say you said yes. Some of you in here let your 15-year-old get a kid get a job and you want him to work Sunday mornings. Preacher, it's important he learns to work. It's even more important he learns how to stay out of hell. It's quiet in here. Don't, don't let him trade money for salvation, money for service to God. Hey, listen, he can work Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. Say, Preacher, he can work Wednesday night. No, because he'll be in youth group. He'll be in youth groups and preacher. Is youth group important? Yes. If you make it important, it's going to get quieter. Some of us are more concerned with our children being the next great softball phenom 
than we are about whether they'll be in heaven one day with us or not. It's got quiet. I've been on Facebook. I couldn't get a like if I bought one right now. <laughs> preacher, is there anything wrong with softball? Again, I didn't say there's anything wrong with anything. There's a lot of things that are nothing wrong with them. It's not sin. It's not immoral. But let me tell you this. It's either focusing them on Jesus or it's not. And if it's preventing them from coming to Christ, you need to draw a line in the sand and say, I will not do this with my children. Can I, I'm gonna get, I mean, I've been run out here. Half of you ain't coming back anyway, so I'll just go ahead and keep going. <laughs> but you know when you, don't, you get up and you go, like, I ain't going to church today because you ain't going to church today? You know what I'm talking about. I ain't going. Why? I don't want to. Ain't nothing wrong with you. You know what your kid says? Hmm. He said, you know, I noticed Dad wouldn't do that at work. How many people just say, I ain't going to work today? Yeah, I ain't going. Why not? I just don't want to. How many people do that? We don't. You know why? It's a priority. We need money. We want to pay our bills. And we don't want to get fired. But we'll say that on church in a heartbeat. You know why we do that? Focus ain't right. Preacher, it ain't sin not to come. It's a weight, though, that's stopping you. And I'm afraid that some of us in here will teach our children so many things that have nothing to do with heaven and hell and what they need from Jesus Christ and we'll lay out a church and prove to our children that God and this Bible that we talk about really is not a priority in our lives. And by the way, let me remind you, you know what your kid wants to be more than anything in this world? He wants to be just like you. Your child's greatest aspiration is to be like you. And whatever you value in your life, they'll value in their life. And whatever you set out as a priority in their life, that's what will be a priority in their life. And what we want our children to do is see us and see what Jesus can do through us. And it's not that we got to give up everything, but we've also got to set aside time that Jesus is important in our lives. And these weights are so dangerous because there's nothing wrong with any of them. It's the way we apply them and allow them to be in our lives. Friend, how, how, how disappointing it would be if our child turned out to be the smartest doctor, the greatest athlete, but never met Jesus Christ and never went to heaven. How sad would that be in our lives? How sad. How heartbreaking would it be for us to arrive in heaven never to meet our children again? See, preacher, that's somber. Yes, it is. Our focus should be somber as well. Our focus should be important as well. You say, preacher, my kid don't like youth group. My kids didn't like good food, but I made them eat it anyway. I mean, I'm already out here. I'll just say it. Listen, you know, my, my kids ain't never thought about going, Dad, I'm not going to youth group tonight. I said, it's better than dying, son. I'd go ahead and go if I was you. <laughs> well, the job down there at Bilo, they, they won't let me off. I'm not bashing Bilo. I'm using it as a, just an example. Well, then you don't need that job down at Bilo. Somebody else will hire you and let you go to youth group on Wednesday night. Some of you shaking your head, and I appreciate it. Thank you. It helps me. Just the fact that you're breathing and you're smiling. It helps me a lot. <laughs> you see, our focus must be on the main thing, which is Jesus. It, it's terrible that we call ourselves Christians and don't focus on Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Like, what? It's Jesus Christ. That's why we're called Christians. He's like the Christ. And then we say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, but our focus is everywhere but Christ. Is that terrible or what? Huh? It's crazy, isn't it? But then we, we think about eliminating distractions. They're everywhere there in every part of our life and in work and hobbies and relationships that we have. If they're not right, they need to be done away with because they're holding us back. They're holding us back. But I'm going to give you the second thing. The second thing is the, I mean the third thing. The third thing is something that most people have never thought about. And I'm not, I'm not knocking this. I'm just saying we've never thought of this. We've never in our mind really sat down like this and thought this out. But notice what it says in verse 1. He said, we've got to lay aside these weights and the sins. And then what's he say? Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You see, we've got to develop a long-term plan. You see, he's running with patience the race of life. It is a long race, and we must run it with patience. How many people understand today, and I want you to get this, have you heard the saying, life is a journey, not a destination? How many people, you, you heard that? I want you to understand that the Christian life is not about what you're doing today. It's not about what you're doing tomorrow. And it's not even about what you're doing next year. The, the Christian life is about the totality of what you did in your life. Romans says this, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself 
to God. One day Matt Burrell will stand before God and God will say, Matt, I gave you a wife, I gave you children, I gave you a job, I gave you a, a church and all these people. What did you do with all of that? I will be judged on the totality of my life. I mean, you think about that. What's that going to feel like to stand there? Now, I'm going to take you all to a real somber place, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to be a downer because I, I don't even want to watch sad movies. People say, hey, I'm going to watch this movie about three people got killed. They, no, I don't want to see that. It just makes me depressed. <laughs> but I do want to take you to a somber place right now. If Matt Burrell is one day going to stand before God, he needs a plan. The question is, what do I want my life to be? I went to the doctor this week because my wife made me. <laughs> she said, you need to, you, need to, you know, you're, and she, I hate when you, you hear these you're getting to that age where you need a family doctor. That's his way of saying, you're old. Go to the doctor. So you go to the doctor. But why do we hate going to the doctor, y'all? Because you hate, you think you're going to go to the doctor feeling good, like go busting up there. Hey, what's up, doc? And he says, ooh. Isn't that right? That's what scares us, isn't it? Go take that blood and you go find out, oh, Lord. Right? But let me ask you a question. What if, what if, and God forbid, but what if I go in there, I get my blood work, Man, I just go busting in there. Y'all doing all right? Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take your blood and leave. And then they call me and say, hey, we need to talk to you. I walk in, 46 years old, and they say, hey, Matt, you got six months to leave. You ain't going to make it. Can that happen? Does that happen? Oh, yes. I buried a lot of people younger than me. Lots of people. What's the first thing I'm going to do? Well, I got to get to work, man. I got this project I need to finish. Is that the first thing I'm going to do? Huh? I mean, I, I got to call my, my, my investment guy and find out how my 401k is doing. I, I need to invest some more money in that. Boy, I need to buy some more stock. Is that, is that what I'm doing? Oh, no. You know what probably the first thing I'm going to do? Call my wife. Get my kids. Start breaking down time with them and saying, listen, man, I want you to know this, and I want you to remember that, and I want you to know this about me and know that about me. I, I want to tell you these things because I know I'm fixing to go on. It's going to be done. Everybody with me? What will my life add up to at that moment? Will it be about jobs and cars and stuff and things that don't matter, or will it be about some things that I'm telling you I want to make sure of in that moment? Well, you know what I want? I want a legacy. When I do die and they lay me in the ground, what do I want people to remember about me? Oh, he's a nice guy. He had weird hair all the time, but he was a nice guy. Is that what I want remembered? Is that, is that what I want the totality of my life to be stacked up of? Of he was a nice guy, he worked a job, he was a friendly dude, he had a nice car. Is that really what I want? My question is, how many people here have ever sat down and really wrote out a legacy statement for their family? This is what I want with my children. This is what I want with my family. This is what I want to achieve with my life. This is how I want to be remembered. How many people have ever done that? I want to challenge you to do that. You see, here's what's important to me. Can I say what's important to me? It's important that every one of my children get saved. So when I die, I don't have to worry about them, where they'll be there or not. I want every one of my grandchildren to come to Jesus Christ so that one day when I die, no matter what, I know that eventually I'll see every one of them again. Number one priority in my life. Number one priority in my life. And when I stand before God, what do I really want to be able to say? I did all these physical things that don't matter. They don't last. They go away. God don't care how much money I make, how nice my house is, my car. He don't care about that. He's going to look into that spiritual investment and say, what did you do? And today's challenge, this is just a very small part of it, and I believe most of you in here can do this and should do this. I want you to write out a legacy statement. What do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your family to be like? Maybe you're here and you're not married and you're thinking about getting married. What do you want your spouse to be like? What do you want them to be like? What do you want your children to turn out to be? What is your ultimate goal in life? When it's summed up and your life is over, what would you want two sentences to say about you and what you did? Some of us need to write that down. Why? Because it focuses our lives on what it should be. Because I can't get to that statement until I know what that statement is. Some of us need to write that down because it's so hard to figure out what your life is really about. If I stop by any of your pews right now and just walk up to you and say, hey, in two sentences, tell me what it is you're trying to achieve with your life. How difficult would that be? It'd be difficult. Because we've got to decide what we want to be in order to do it. But I want you to notice the second thing. Y'all are not going to like this one at all, and y'all probably won't even do it. 
see, some of you, I heard breath go out of here. <laughs> I did. I want you to write a legacy statement. Then the next thing I want you to do is go on a 30-day fast. Not from food, because I know you can't do that. But I want you to fast for 30 days. I want you to have no social media, no Facebook, unless you're watching service online. No Twitter, no Instagram, no TikTok for 30 days. Why? Because some of you in here can't live your life because of the stress of Facebook, Instagram, and, and all these things in your life. Some of you, Twitter's got your nerves so tore up you can't even be happy about life. If you're young in here, you know what I'm talking about. Twitter's crazy. No news outlets. Some of you need to get off the stinking news. Somebody say amen about that. Amen. Fox, CNN, MSNBC, get off the news for 30 days. So preacher, how am I going to know what the weather's like? Do like your great granddaddy did. Open the door, look outside and go, looks like it might rain today. <laughs> Let the weather be a surprise. Dang, it's hot. That's what I want you to do. No internet. Did you hear that? No. That's an N and an O means zero. Unless it's absolutely necessary you work on the internet. Why? Because you need to get off of it. You know what these are, Barry Rash? These are distractions in your life. I ain't heard God speak in my life. No wonder. You're listening to all of them. You know, it's hard to hear God with all that going on. Heard a preacher say this week, and I thought it was a great statement. He said, Jesus cannot be our peace when our focus is on the world. You see, there's something about having none of these distractions in your life that God can use. Think about where God met Moses in the backside of the desert all by himself. Think about where he spoke to Jonah down in the whale's belly all by himself. Think about Paul when Paul got saved. The Bible says he sent him out into Arabia and God ministered into him there. You see, God wants all these distractions out of your life so he can speak to you. Preacher, I read my Bible, I don't get anything out of it. I don't get anything out of it. It's because your mind is full of that. That. It's got your mind rolling and flipping and turning over. Some of you are vegan one day, low carb the next, cardio this week and weights the next, just because you found information that changed your mind. Friend, I want to tell you, these people want to control your lives and your thinking. <laughs> the next one, you ain't going to like it either, but I'm going to give it to you. After the 30 days is up. By the way, you can re-upload Facebook after 30 days. I don't know if you know. You can delete it off your phone and you can pull it back. You can do that. But I want you to see the next thing I want you to do. After 30 days, you've gotten your, you've gotten your fast off your internet and your news and the, and the social media. The next, after those 30 days, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take one week a month and schedule nothing but what you have to do for work. No ball tournaments, no, no, no commitments, no got to get together with somebody, got to do this, got to see so-and-so, got to be there. You know what you'll do when you do that? Anything you want to do. You'll be able to do like your grandparents. You'll be able to roll in the house about 5 o'clock and go, you know what, I'm going to Tony's. I need a chocolate shake. There's some, there's some enjoyment in having less commitment in your life, church. Why is everybody running your schedule except you? Why has everybody got your, listen, grandparents, it's okay to tell your kids, no, I ain't keeping your grandkids tonight. Why? I need a break. It's okay. Why do we let other people run our schedules? Y'all not going to do this. Every, nobody in this room or on the internet will do this, but I, the next thing I want you to do is one day a week have absolutely no screen, no phone, no iPad, no TV, no podcast, unless it's work. You know, work, you got to answer the phone. You better return your boss's text. You're looking for a job. You say, well, preacher, what am I going to do if I don't do that? Well, maybe you'll read a book. Maybe you'll talk to somebody. Huh? Maybe you can read your Bible. Maybe, just maybe, you could have real friends, not online ones. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Listen, I, I, here's my challenge to you, church. God wants to speak to you. He wants to, but he is fighting for your attention. He's fighting for your attention. He's talking to you right now. He's trying to explain to you what he wants for your life. He's trying to move you to the next place of your life. You can't hear him because that's all you can hear. You, you can't hear him because all you can hear is how bad 2020 was and how bad 2021 is going to be. And should you be scared and should you be worried and all these things and all this bad, bad, bad. It's just clutter, 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 busy, busy, busy. And God's trying to get through 
and we can't cure him. I want to say this to you. Most all of you in here will not do this. Some of you will lie to me and say, yeah, I'm going to do it, preacher. And you'll be sneaking around like an addict looking at your phone. And, and, and so most of you won't do that. But, but if somebody in here would, if a family in here would, I believe in those 30 days, if you'd read your Bible each day like we've challenged you to anyway, if you're reading your Bible and you had this out of your mind, I believe God would speak to you in a fresh way. I'm not talking about a sign in your front yard, but I'm talking about God would move you in the direction that he wants you to be in. Will you pray with me? Father, I ask you today,